retro gaming comes with many caveats, many rules and many processes you need to get it right. Or so some say, which is obviously not true at all. One of the big nostalgic attractions for old computers and consoles is because we played it on completely different hardware. CRTs or cathode ray tubes were the pinnacle of gaming and arcades back in the day and predominantly still are. Arcades haven't really drastically moved on as they're predominantly dead now. But obviously, buying all this retro equipment and certainly buying decent old CRT screens can get expensive. But me being me, I tend to like to get a bargain and I love fixing things, sometimes even more than using them. I'm sure there's other people like me as well. I love that challenge of getting something back to life. So this video is all around that subject. Certainly on a budget, one of the things that I like to do is get bang for a buck and get the best value and certainly Retro gaming has never been more expensive, and CRTs are even more expensive. Luckily, this video is designed around something I've been doing for a long time, which is fixing old things, old CRTs, and sometimes selling them. Now, this is around an old CRT that I found, well, my wife found, actually, at the side of the road, and it was not in great condition. And this is me restoring that, finding the faults, putting it back together on an absolute budget. Now, this was free. So this is as cheap as it gets, but you can pick up old screen CRTs uh, from eBay, from car boots, from anywhere else, you know, from retro shops, from um, charity shops. There are chances of picking some of these old things up, and even if they're broken, they're not always beyond repair. There are some caveats to that, and obviously the biggest caveat is, I'm not saying do this if you've got no electronic experience at all, because fixing CRTs does have some relevant risks, which I'll cover in this video, but overall, this is the journey I went through from taking an old Sony Triniton and turning it from a knackered old heat that's broken into a completely fully working and very very good quality CRT for use for your retro gaming. Perfect if you want to put it inside an old arcade cabinet and make something out of it. This case was particularly knackered. So without further ado let's get into restoring CRTs and going retro on a budget. So what we've got here is a Sony Trinitron. And you can just see it there. The LED's flashing. And it's probably a voltage problem. It's a bloody voltage problem. But as you can see, it's not in the best condition. It's been dropped, found it, <laughs> at the side of the road. Zero cost. Um, and it was covered in dirt, which you can still see inside. Um, I haven't cleaned it yet. You can see the dust and dirt and grime. I managed to dry it out, left it here for a couple of days just to make sure that it was dried off to turn on. Put a new plug on it and it powers on. And we've got a fault light, which is good. It also means that I've got to take the rest of it apart. Now the back was filthy but I have already taken that off and put it in the shower effectively and that's the, that's the joy, you can just clean these with the shower and that's, I didn't video it before but it was absolutely caked in dirt so compared to what it looks like now, it looks brand new so I'm going to let that fully dry out, which it's dried out already quite a bit um, and then we're going to fix the TV, take that apart and this will hopefully be another video that people will learn from if they want to get a cheap TV, fix it, and get retro gaming. The Triniton is the best. Let's move on. Obviously, in a mixture of a busy household with wife and kids, there's a lot of background noise. So there's going to be a mixture of sounds here. So this clean quality sound you're getting now is just obviously me post-dubbing because the sound was just too distorted or unclear to use. So effectively what I'm doing here is the most important part of these CRTs, which is to earth the actual anode itself. So the anode is the main voltage that runs to the uh, phosphor dots at the front of the screen. So the phosphor screen is a positive charge and the cathode at the back is negative and it's drawn to the front. So this isn't going to kill you. Obviously, it's not going to be very pleasant. So you want to make sure that you take a metal screwdriver. I'm using here crocodile clips to so just jump leads for a car battery, basically. Um, stick a nail in the ground, clip the other side to that, or somewhere where you get a nice, good quality earth, so a chair leg that's touching the floor or something outside that's, that's earth properly. And then there, those little prongs, that's where the anode cable is, and that's the one that gives you the positive charge. If it's been left on, it will, it will give you a little arc, a little pop, 
as you touch it and once that's done it's completely safe at that point you can just disconnect it let it hang around and that's where most of the charge and voltage will sit on the board so once that's done the rest of the board will be nice and stable and that way you can just disconnect all the cables remove all the things that hold it into the chassis itself so this is the C board here this drives the actual deflection yokes the RGB laser that go down to the tube so this is important a very vital part of the screen so don't mess around with this and try and do it with it connected disconnect the earth point from the screen itself there and then disconnect all the sockets you can and then pull it away from the actual tube the cathode tube itself so that you're not connected and make sure you spend time doing this you feel the dust and dirt on this disconnect everything the surface layer of the dirt just so you get a nice clean connection then grab a vacuum as long as everything's earthed and turned off you're not you know creating any static electricity just remove all that surface dirt as much as you can with a vacuum it's perfectly safe don't push hard on any areas and bend things around just get all as much of the surface dirt off it's not going to clean it it's just going to remove all the surface dirt so you've got a good look at what you're working with and at that point you're then going to have to whack out the white spirit you know the turpentine so effectively anything that's alcohol based to clean that actual surface itself the pcb so you can use an earbud a cotton wool bud or a q-tip as it's called in america just to get into those intricate areas but if you've got such a dirty board like this then probably just get a rag um, i'm using here old kitchen towel thick good quality kitchen towel kleenex or something and then just dip that into the terps wipe it all over the board again don't push don't bend you're just removing all that surface dirt so you can see the board for what it is and you can see what you're working with and as you can see here speed it up it just takes about 30 minutes 40 minutes to get it nice and clean enough to be able to do the next stage of the repair Once all that's done, you've got a nice clean board. Then you can start looking at any faults and issues. So we know that this has got a fault by turning on. So it's definitely a voltage issue. It's definitely a power issue. It's something not getting to the um, screen itself. It's either the uh, vertical sink, horizontal sink, whatever's going on there. So most likely it's the vertical sink that caused these problems. And I'm speaking in hindsight now. I know what the problem was. It was um, a vertical sink, but that was my first port of call because it's the heaviest part of the unit in terms of power voltage. But on this board, what I did note there was other problems. So the first thing was I went through the board and looked for any leakage on the uh, capacitors. And there's none. None of them are popped. None of them are bulged. There was no electrolyte leakage anywhere. It was all nice and clean. So that, that didn't work. The next part was to look at any cold solder joints. That happens a lot. Obviously, CRTs run a lot of electricity. They run for long periods of time. And therefore, you get cold solder joints as they dry out. And sure enough, there was loads on the board. So I managed to find some spots here. As you can see me wiggling it around. Some were completely disconnected. So essentially you were missing complete connections to those parts of the unit so therefore the board wasn't turning on and those those LED uh, morning lights at the start, that's just the flashing light to tell you what the fault is. So this one was four flashes, which is um, the vertical sink. It will usually tell you in the manual. So go online, find the manual for the actual CRT you've got. Most places do it for free. There's a link down below the site that I find them from. And they can give you the schematics, which helps a lot, because then you can find the actual unit. You can trace it through. And once you can understand and read electronic or circuit boards, it makes all of this a lot easier because you can trace where the faults are. Nine times out of 10, you, you, you use the KISS model. Whenever you're doing fault repairs or fault finding, you'd use the KISS model, which is keep it simple, stupid. And that works the same for software as well. If you're doing development and you're debugging, um, always think of the simplest things first. Most people run off with the most complicated solutions and electronics are very, very simple. They're logical. You know, they're logic boards. That's what they are, same as software. So the best place to start first off is power. Is power getting to the board? So trace the actual plug straight to the main unit. Is the fuse popped? Is the disconnection? Is the cable worn, feathered? Is it is it worn through? And then work your way through. Don't go rushing into, oh, it's probably the cathode or the anode's gone and all that kind of stuff, because it's probably not. It's probably the easiest part of the board. The next stage is to go across the board with the multimeter using the continuity. So you're checking that the current is getting from one end to the next. And then you're checking voltage, you're checking resistors, you're checking capacitors to make sure that you're not losing points on the PCB board or you're losing voltage somewhere in that process. 
So doing that, I didn't find anything, no lost traces across the board, apart from the IC area, like I say, around the vertical sink. So that means that I was losing voltage down that point, so I definitely knew it was a fault there at that, that section. So what I did was, before I did all that replacement, I went across the board, and you can see this fluid here, this is flux, and this helps the wetting of the board and the pads, so it helps that solder join, gives more moisture to it, so it doesn't break down and oxidize too quickly. And that's effectively what these cold solder joints are, oxidization across a period of time, so it dries out and cracks. So I'm fixing all these on the main board, the A board, the C board to make everything join correctly. And that actually got me to the point of having the screen turn on. So I then got a picture, but I had just a, a horizontal line straight across the screen right in the middle, which is obviously that's telling you straight away it's a vertical sync issue. So you're getting a beam across the screen, but you're not getting it returning back to the top, the heaviest part, as I suspected at the start, because it tends to be the most common fault on CRTs. So all of that got me to the point of, I would have had a problem if I hadn't done that first. So it's well worth it. Go around and check all your joints. There's no bleeding capacitors. There's no electrolyte leaking or anything like that. So the board's clean, everything else is clean, which means I have to go and buy the unit. So the main IC, I think it's 501, you can see it here. I went and purchased online. So there's a link down below the site that I use. There's a few sites you can use. Again, this is going back to the, having the actual manual itself that tells you a lot of the units you need to buy the actual part number and that makes it very very easy to find it so always do search on that site and find the actual particular manual for your uh, particular crt and then you know which parts to buy so this is the offending article so this is the vertical sink ic chip but we take the new one put a bit of thermal paste on the back and then put it all back together and we should hopefully have a working unit that is the plan nine times out of ten it's going to be this area of the board it might be the capacity might be lucky it might be a cold solder joint you, you rejoin it and everything works so it, it definitely improved the situation because i could get the machine to turn on or the screen to turn on but unfortunately it didn't fix it so the new unit you have to disconnect all of the heat shield the rf shield here that's got a heat sink and some heat sink at the back of the ic so desolder it from the bottom both the actual shield itself the heat sink area from the board and also the ic clean desolder removed and then you can see here it's all knackered and bent looking but essentially it's been heavily used and i've just removed it from the board you take your brand spanking new one here which looks nice and shiny and new and you just reattach it to the board don't screw it all the way in but definitely put some thermal paste at the back to give it a good conductivity to the heat sink itself and the rf shield and then reattach that back to the pads on the board and again it looked like it had been done before here there's some areas around here or at least somebody's had a go at it probably just tried to resolder it badly but effectively put all that back in resolder all the points back up again use lots of uh, flux to get a good connection on the pads and then once everything's soldered back in you can see it here all cleanly soldered just again do a whole run across your board to make sure there's nothing else outstanding because there's nothing worse than putting everything back together and realizing you've missed one little bit um, and once you've done all that and everything's straight it's soldered you've got good connection everywhere you've not got any gaps you plug everything back together and luckily the sound here on a sunday morning was quite and nice and quiet so you can hear me and the revelation of the screen actually working and that and now that that's all back together, we should be able to make sure it's in the front, flick it on. And I can hear a screen on, I can feel it. Wait. We've got sound. Have you ever lost a loved one, Mr. Bond? I've got a picture. M sent me because we're afraid you're a nightmare. And again, it's too loud. So what I'm trying to say here is it's too red. You can see the lines on the screen. So what you need to do at the back of the actual screen itself, you've got on the C board, you've got these two knobs. We're on the left, which is for the white, the brightness, the color convergence on the actual tube itself. Just twiddle that to the left and the right, uh, to the right at this point, and converge the image back. And you'll see all those red lines and that red image, it will disappear. It will clean up, look sharp, look clean. And that's exactly what you want and get that balance in terms of the image. Use a couple of import sources. Don't just use one VHS here. Uh, certainly not uh, just PAL and NTSC, never the same color twice. And then use some video game input times as well. And again, from that, you also need to do the right hand side one, which is the focus. And that focuses those beams, that convergence into one place. Use text, so something like the Saturn menu or any text in game that's on the screen, and just twiddle that to give you a nice sharp image. And that will sharpen up the image on a CRT. And you need to do that to get everything ready. And then from then on in, 
you need to get into the service menu to configure the screen properly. So the commands work the same then as they do now. This is the exact same input you can do on modern Sony TVs and it will still work. Obviously different makes and models will have different menus. You can search online for them. Press the buttons, get into the screen. You'll see this menu here, go to adjust. And then you need to set all the things like the vertical height, the horizontal sync, the vertical breadth, and it will condense and squash the screen. You'll see it moving around left and right, up and down. Make sure you check everything out, including the RGB color balance and everything else so that you've got it set properly and use a couple of inputs. So here I'm using the PS1, the Saturn, the Mega Drive, and all of those things give you a convergence of the right image quality. And then everything's set, it'll work for pretty much any input you've got perfectly. And then you have a fully working Sony Trinitron. As you can see here, beautifully on a Sunday morning with a nice cup of coffee. No, and my wife's lovely chocolate cake there. It's a little bit too early for that. Here watching the NTSC version of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I used to import a lot of my videos back in the late 80s, early 90s. I imported a lot of things at the time there, including my Mega Drive in 89. And way before the UK had it, so I used to buy a lot of American tapes. In fact, I used to buy all American tapes, really, um, just because they had a lot of uncut versions and things that we couldn't get over. There was a lot of editing and... Uh, the video nasty scare and all the censorship in the UK made it very hard to get filmed, so US was the place to get them. It was very easy to import back then. To be I, used to, I had hundreds of um, NTSC tapes at the time. I used to love the whole cardboard sleeves. We didn't have every those plastic bulbous cases. Um, and one of the benefits of the Trinitron is the fact that it, you know, very early on, it natively supported PAL 50 hertz and NTSC 60 hertz, and it just flicked between the two of them very simply. So a lot of screens at the time. Even if they did support NTSC, and I've used that in quotes, they were either black and white or they had like a, a judder at the bottom of the line distorting, it'd be all over the place. So generally a lot of screens didn't, but the Trinitrons did. So you could easily just flip between US and American tapes. And I had a couple of VHS players at the time. I've probably got way too many screens kicking around now. This is probably about the fifth Trinitron that I fixed. Um, I'll probably keep it because I like the fact that I've done it and buy an old unit and just uh, replace the case and use that and you'll probably see it tucked away in some of my later videos to come. It's a great, great screen, great for videos and VHS, great for gaming, uh, the quality is really good. There's a few issues left in terms of interference on the board, I'll probably go back over and clean those areas up. But generally, it's it's very good now, it works perfectly and I'll definitely be using it in the future. I'll probably need to sell some of my older ones, I've got some old Philips and JVC and Bush ones kicking around that I probably need to sell, Panasonic ones. So I'll probably clear those out and get some space. I've got CRTs and I've got monitors and Commodore screens, everything everywhere at the moment. So I probably need to just make a little bit of space. I did fix this quite a few months ago now. I just never got around to putting a video together. But hopefully you found this video beneficial and educational. As you can see, it, it really does the job in terms of delivering that image quality, that sharpness that only CRTs can deliver. And that contrast in terms of color and the depth of blacks. That's it's getting, CRTs are, are still brilliant at that. They're, they're not you know, unbeatable now. And there's lots of, uh, you know, it's all about the balance. But modern TVs are getting close but generally when you're playing older games they just look so much better because the whole art style the pixel style and certainly the way that they used you know dithering and blending was all designed around that CRT method of blending those pixels together so what looks sharp and too dithered on modern screens looks great on CRTs because that's what the art was designed for specifically 2D art and what was being popular at the time even some of the 3D art here which you can see from PS1 from Tekken 3 and Virtua Fighter 2 and so many of the titles that just look great on this little box so I'm, I'm happy that I've fixed it I'm happy that I've put it together and hopefully all of this has given you the impetus to have a go yourself and if you are wanting to get into retro gaming or you've got a little retro machine but you don't want to spend a fortune on an old screen then have a look around if you find an old broken CRT somewhere there are rules that, you know, if, if the screen's cracked or the tubes broke um, or you know the front of the screen's got any kind of damage on it at all the actual tube itself the bulb then forget about it it's broken it's not fixable if you look inside and there's smoke and there's burnt out parts nine times out of ten that's probably dead as well because it's had too much going on but outside of that if it just doesn't turn on or it's got faults that are flashing which is really good or you've got some you know lines on the screen or distortion or anything like that then they're all fixable and you'd be surprised how many CRTs that people have thrown away just like this one that's going to be dumped at the side of the road I mean who does that I mean take it to the tip for God's sake but um, if you did if they didn't do it I wouldn't have found it but fundamentally there's a lot of CRTs that can be fixed and should be fixed because at some point they're going to get less and less and less because thousands and thousands of them get thrown away every day still still quite a lot of houses especially around Europe that still use CRTs so they're not dead yet anyway i've probably rabbled on enough hopefully you enjoyed this retro look this retro reminder of just why we're all into these kind of areas and just how crazy and mad i am that i just fix things that most people would throw away as they say one man's meat is another man's poison 
What you put in your toilet, I place on my mantle. Anyway, I will leave you with a few more minutes or moments of footage here on this old repaired CRT. And if you did like this, remember I'm completely self-funded and independent. So like, share and all that good stuff it really helps. And I really appreciate each and every one of you that does. And I will see you on the next one. Keep your retro.